Welcome to the Alain Guillot podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Andy Norman. Andy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Alain. It's nice to be here. So, Andy, I wonder if we could start by you telling us a little bit about your background and your development into critical thinking. I mean, I assume that as a little kid, you believe everything that your parents told you. You probably believe in Santa Claus and the tooth fairy and all this and that. <laughs> but eventually you started asking yourself questions and, and started using your own mind to make your own assumptions about the world around you. And then now you are into philosophy and you're sharing your thoughts and ideas with the rest of us. So yeah, take us back to your past and tell us how that evolution happened. Yeah, well, let's see. I'll, I'll pick up the story when I was an undergraduate in college. I was um, sitting uh, in, a, in a dorm lounge with some fellow students and we were complaining about the sorry lack of wisdom our species, species seems to exhibit. And um, a friend turned to me and said, hey, Andy, quit complaining. Why don't you do something about it? <laughs> so I, uh, shortly thereafter, I declared my major as a philosopher, and I decided to dedicate my life to understanding how to acquire a little bit of wisdom and sharing what I learned along the way. So for about 30, almost 40 years now, I've been studying how the wisest among us think and what they do differently uh, so that we can learn to be uh, better versions of ourselves. Um, along the way, I, I realized that a big part of acquiring wisdom is the ability to let go of bad ideas. So um, the, I think one of the distinguishing characteristics of the wise is the ability to spot and remove bad ideas um, and, and to do that more habitually than the rest of us do. Um, it turns out also that the mind's ability to spot and remove bad ideas functions just like the body's immune system does. So just as the body's immune system is supposed to identify infectious microbes and target them for removal, um, the mind has an immune system and its job is to identify dysfunctional ideas and target them for removal. Um, so when I realized this, I came to understand that we're not doing nearly enough to promote critical thinking in our world, and that this emerging science of mental immunity, I call it cognitive immunology, that this emerging science has tremendous potential to protect us against uh, epidemics of viral misinformation, the kind of phenomena that we're seeing cause so much dislocation in our world today. So that's what the book is about. And I like to think that uh, its message is, is more than timely. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, uh, uh, young people always think that they can change the world. I mean, that's why you see so many uh, manifestations around university campus, they always see something wrong with the system that the way that we are living is uh, unsustainable, and then quickly they fall in line and, you know, yes, they just start doing whatever the parents were doing or whatever the institutions above them tell them to do. So what is it about you particularly yeah, that you decided to continue challenging the conventional wisdom and, and just try to nourish that uh, individual thinking? Yeah, I think it's it's very easy as a young person, as an adolescent, to conclude that previous generations have gotten it all wrong and that we just need to need a revolution to get things right. What many young people fail to appreciate under circumstances like that is that there are many, many ways to get things wrong for every one way there is to get things right. So simply tearing down what exists um, does not automatically bring a better solution in uh, to replace it. In fact, it's often quite hard to, to uh, design a solution that's better than what previous generations have come up with, which isn't to say we shouldn't try. It's just that we need to be judicious and patient and thoughtful and employ the best methods of idea testing 
to identify real better solutions. Um, when I was a uh, young man, uh, let's say a uh, teenager, maybe early 20s, I, and, and I have spoken to my audience about this, I used to be racist and homophobic. And at the same time, I used to criticize others for the way of thinking. So, uh, and, and I admit uh, I was, I had this ideology in mostly because of my environment. I mean, we were in this kind of racist, homophobic environment. So I'm going to give part of the blame to my previous behavior to that environment where I live. But to what extent, to what extent should we take personal responsibility? And to what extent should we say, okay, I think of this way just because of my environment? Wow, that's a wonderful question, Elaine. Um, it's a, you've put your finger on a really important tension. Let, let me validate both sides of the, of the tension you're pointing to. Um, thinking and, and uh, idea filtration. So the process of identifying bad ideas and removing them is fundamentally a social process. Um, we need to rely on those around us to do the job well. So this is what makes science special is that it's a communal, it's a, it's kind of a um, uh, distributed or crowdsourced way to test theories. Um, and it works so well precisely because no one, one person thinks they have all the answers, but instead defer to a distributed system that is wiser than any one of its members. Well, this is true generally for all of us. You don't have to be a scientist to be highly dependent on the people in your community for the information you rely on. If you happen to fall in with people who have unreliable methods of uh, believing or un unreliable methods of sorting out the things that are worth believing from the things that aren't, um, you're liable to come up, fall under the sway of those same ideas. So you're in no way unusual, Elaine, in having bought into some bad ideas um, from your community. We, are, we all face that challenge. At the same time, we need each and every one of us to uh, take responsibility to rise above the limiting um, uh, constraints of our social circles or our, 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 our filter, you know, the people in our, in our filter bubbles. Um, so a major theme of my book is that we need to get beyond self-indulgent ideas like I'm entitled to my opinion, so go away and leave me alone and say, you know what, we don't just have rights when it comes to our beliefs and opinions, we also have responsibilities and we all need to reprioritize responsible cognition if we're going to get out of this uh, post-truth situation. That we've that we now find ourselves in okay yes but when let's say let's take uh, the example of the anti-maskers uh let's say i'm all surrounded by other uh, anti-maskers who reinforce my my core belief that yeah, we shouldn't be masking because whatever the government has no right to tell us what to do okay so if this is my environment and this is the echo chamber that I live in, I find it quite difficult to just step out of the echo chamber and say, okay, well, I'm going to also try to reflect on what the other side, side is saying, what the maskers are saying, and risk being isolated from my community. And so, uh, I mean, sure, we have to take personal responsibility and there is a cost to that. And how is it, how difficult or easy it is to start applying, uh, yeah, to start thinking yeah. by ourselves. You, you, um, you, you described that problem uh, beautifully well, Elaine. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, many people, um, today in say the anti-masker or anti-vaccine movement in, in America feel as though they can't challenge the views of the people around them without losing their standing mm -hmm. within, within, their, within their, their core group. Um, and and so, so we're seeing behavior, for example, where people go to get vaccinated, but, but who disguise themselves and ask the vaccinators to, to preserve their anonymity so their neighbors don't find out that they're, they're getting vaccinated, right? 
So the, all of which is to to validate the the challenge you've identified. Look, I think we all need to realize there's some things more important than just fitting in, mm. right? Um, and and when lives are at stake, when the the viability of our democracy democracies, I should say, since this is an international audience, when uh, the well-being of our democracies is, is, is at stake, sometimes you have to risk ostracism, sometimes you have to risk social sanction to speak truth to, to power and to speak truth to, um, to, to a kind of mob mentality. So, I mean, I, I, a useful analogy here is imagine an enraged mob out in search of vigilante justice um, you get caught up in this mob and you suddenly realize, wait a minute, this is crazy. Um, vigilante justice is not a, an acceptable solution to due process and, and true justice. What are you going to do in the middle of the crowd? Are you going to stand up in, in the middle of this uh, bloodthirsty crowd and say, no, wait, stop, everyone, listen to reason. It's a hard thing to do, right? Well, this... Emerging science of cognitive immunology talks about, uh, helps to illuminate some of the things we can do without paying too much of a cost. So one of the things you can do, for example, when you are meeting with family, so imagine, suppose some of, some of your family members are uh, anti-vax or anti-mask, but you're getting together with them over the holidays anyway. Um, you don't have to challenge them and engage in antagonistic argumentation, what you can do instead is ask gentle clarifying questions to help them un appreciate their own lack of understanding. So this, this, this is a technique that goes all the way back to one of my heroes, the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates. Socrates was a master at asking clarifying questions to help people realize, oh, I guess I didn't know what I was, what I thought I knew. Yeah, I, um, I should have point out that Socrates was uh, committed suicide or was forced to commit suicide. So he paid he a price for his critical thinking uh, uh, way of living. Your point well, point well taken. Um, the, the world's um, best, the world's wisest people have often paid a price for opposing mass delusions. Um, Socrates was arguably one of the first, and he was uh, he was convicted and sentenced to death, and and was given a fatal dose of hemlock, and that at age seventy, and that was the end of his days, which goes to show that um, having the courage of your convictions can be d dangerous work, mm. and yet our world needs it now more than ever. Right. Mm. Okay. Um, as a podcaster. Uh, uh, I go through a lot of books and I talk to a lot of people and this is the first time that I ever see a book on mental immunity and you claim in your book that you, we put a lot of energy into uh, looking for antivirus for our body. We spend a lot of time and energy on looking for antivirus for our computers, but we don't invest in anything at all into having a mental immunity. I wonder why is that and why is society not catching up with this important thing? I mean, if we get a, a virus in our mind, we can do horrendous things like you describe a, 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 a gun attack on a school, on a synagogue, I guess, in your book. But there are so many other uh, suicides, contagious as well, uh, obesity is contagious as well. There are so many things and we don't put any amount of money, effort or energy into fighting mental, uh, into developing mental immunity. Yeah. Yeah. So it turns out that the problem of uh, pathogens spreading through biological populations is exactly is structurally identical to the problem of say digital parasites spreading through networks of computers and the problem of bad ideas spreading through populations of minds all of these are are structurally identical problems and what we've learned to do, we've learned to use the principles of epidemiology and immunology to inoculate our bodies. We've learned how to study the spread of, say, um, uh, you know, digital uh, 
viruses using digital uh, epidemiology and and what amounts to an immunology for our computers. We, we develop antivirus programs for our computers to inoculate our computers against the most dangerous digital parasites. But we do this because our bodies and our bodily health is important and our, the well-functioning of our computers is important. But why, but our minds are also important, arguably more important. And so why aren't we doing, taking the same steps to protect them? Um, uh, leading scientists are now talking about infodemiology, which is to say they're, they're studying information epidemiology and taking that very seriously as a discipline. And I'm arguing that we need a, uh, a complementary science called cognitive immunology, which actually studies how the mind's immune system works and figures out how to make it work better. So the science of the original science of immunology has figured out how to strengthen our body's immune systems with vaccines and uh, inoculants. And it's saved literally billions of human lives and, count and, and prevented countless untold amounts of suffering. I think the science of cognitive immunology could have a similarly huge impact on human well-being going into the future. Imagine what would happen if we couldn't inoculate our minds against the most divisive, hateful ideologies, if we could inoculate ourselves against conspiracy, uh, irrational conspiracy thinking, or, or, or dangerous tribalism. Um, the costs to humanity of infodemics, of, of the spread of irrational beliefs is huge. It's in the trillions of dollars every year. So if we can solve this problem, I think we can build a world that is dramatically more peaceful and prosperous. I agree with you. Okay, so I wonder if you could share some tips on how we can, each one of our listeners could yes, develop some mental immunity. Why one or two things that they could do in order to be more skeptic of the misinformation and to try to uh, do at least their own fact checking. The number one thing you can do uh, that each of us can do is to learn not to become reactive to information. So it turns out we often overreact to information we find upsetting or threatening. And when we overreact that way, we often do irrational things. So calm your mind down, slow down your thinking, and replace the reactive emotional response to information you don't like with a uh, measured, uh, okay, I'm not so sure about that. Why don't we look into it? Let, let, let's, let's examine this together and see if that's really correct. Um, so a patient judicious process of collaborative idea testing will help you uh, spot bad ideas and remove them without overreacting to them. And that's the, the trick. We can, we can actually calm these culture wars that right now prevent us from doing shared problem solving. But to do that, we have to calm our minds and um, be a proactive idea testers rather than, than reactive. Um, uh, what, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, when, we, when we allow unwelcome information to trigger us, we're not, we don't become the best versions of ourselves. So you, we need to take back control of our minds and our lives from the information that is triggering uh, irrational and intemperate responses um, and, and learn to uh, test ideas properly the way philosophers have been telling us we need to for thousands of years. Okay, so uh, don't be overreactive. Uh, any anything else? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you. There, that's a good one. Um, a second thing is realize that reasons aren't weapons. Mm. You should never use reasons to try to defeat an enemy. Reasons are tools for gently guiding someone's attention to a relevant consideration, so that they can make up minds their own mind for themselves. When you make that shift between reasons or tools I can use to fight for my side 
to reasons or tools that we collectively can use to appreciate the most significant and relevant considerations that brings down the temperature in a conversation and allows us to dialogue and test ideas fruitfully rather than in the kind of fruitless antagonism that characterizes so much public discourse today. Um, that's two of them. I've got I've got several more, but I'll I'll, 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 I'll like to share many. I like to share the one that I have used to uh, developmental immunity. So I mentioned not too long ago that I, uh, when I was a young uh, man, uh, I was a homophobic and, and a racist. And um, anyways, it's one of my biggest mistakes on life. But I got into the train of uh, the habit of reading. And reading continuously challenged my thoughts, you know, and uh, at a given moment, I dismiss the things that I was reading, but when I hear the same kind of information from different sources, I may start questioning my own thoughts and belief and then do a little bit of um, extended verification or fact checking or inquiring and you know and and I find that reading if I devote at least half an hour of reading every day, that mm. on itself, develops my mind in so many different ways and and even now as a podcaster two years ago I thought that I had everything figured out and every now and then I I run into a book let's say like yours that makes me see things from a different point of view a different angle and it doesn't take much it just takes like 20 minutes of reading per day that's something that people spend on I don't know Netflix or playing video game and, but it's just straightening your mind so much. I mean, that's what I, I think has worked for me. I, I like that idea a great, a great deal. I do think that literacy and the practice of reading thoughtful, measured uh, uh, assessments um, has, a, has a wonderful effect on the mind and an inoculating effect on the mind. So I, I think that's, that's a welcome suggestion, although I hadn't quite articulated it to myself in, in that way. Um, when you say read for 20 minutes a day, you probably don't want to read Twitter, your Twitter feed for 20 <laughs> minutes a day. No, I, I suggest a... reading Andy Norman's book, uh, Mental <laughs> Immunity. That, that would challenge people's uh, mind. <laughs> yeah, all right. Here's what it looks like for those who are seeing it on the... And I just, I'm just going to, I'm sorry, you motivated me. I, I live in a big city, multicultural city. And, and if I get out of my bubble, let's say I'm Latin America, if I live in a bubble of Latin American friends and don't get out of my little bubble, I don't think I have progressed too much, but having the facility of, of living among so many other cultures to venture out with the clubs, organizations, whatever and get to know different people my god i i think that helps so much to to be opposed to people who think differently and uh yeah. anyway. no and to and and the science I'm, I'm promoting validates the wisdom of that because it turns out that uh the people in our bubble aren't well situated to spot the defects in our thinking you have to talk to people from other in with other perspectives if uh if you're going to spot all the flaws in the ideas that you harbor um I, 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 if elaine if you can help me spot the defects in my ideas and i can help you spot the defects in yours we can both come out ahead right but we both have to be open to to gentle criticism from the other side and be and bring a willingness to change our minds when the reason when reasons indicate a need to. And in corporate America right, right now, there's a huge push for inclusion and diversity. And, you know, this is something that uh, is difficult to accept. You know, let's say you have your little group of, let's say, white straight men, and then uh, you get either a person of color or a person that have a uh, different sexual preferences into your group. It's just a it's a hard pill to swallow to all of a sudden have to accommodate this new person and to, you know, uh, try to restrain yourself from saying all the kind of stupid jokes you used to say before. But at the same time, having this different point of view and different way of thinking 
on the long run, I think they have improved corporate uh, America immensely. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, of attempts to uh, spread diversity and inclusion. Uh, I, I worry that some of the workshop, diversity and inclusion workshops that many organizations are investing in, I, I wonder to what extent some of them are counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. By, I, by, I, by arousing the very resentments that, right, that you talk about. Um, I think there's a, a, a better way to do this. Rather than compel everybody at your company to go to a diversity and inclusion workshop and lecture at them about the ways they fall short of being woke or enlightened, far better to create a discussion group, um, a lunchtime discussion group at your organization where people explore ideas in a collaborative spirit and share different points of view. You can actually learn a great deal about inclusion and the, and the value of diversity by using a process I call collaborative idea testing. And, and it's kind of collaborative idea exploration. This is something I've been practicing with my students for decades. Um, and now uh, clients in the military and the nonprofit world and, and in, in the business world are coming to me asking me to run these workshops because I think it creates a very different dynamic and opens minds in ways that your standard diversity and inclusion um, workshop just doesn't. Well, Andy, I have nothing but good things to say about your book. I wonder if you could tell us one more time the uh, title of the book and where can the listeners follow your work? Ah, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the book is titled Mental Immunity, Infectious Ideas, Mind Parasites, and the Search for a Better Way to Think. Uh, it's got a foreword by Steven Pinker, and it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, most places where books are sold. Um, you can learn more about my work on my website, andynorman.org. Uh, and I also hope your listeners will check out the webpage of my research institute, the Cognitive Immunology Research Collaborative. Basically, we're trying, we're a group of scientists and thinkers who are trying to work out how we can inoculate minds against the most dangerous forms of cognitive contagion so that our future generations don't have to suffer the kind of culture wars and, and spreads and, and epidemics of mass irrationality that characterize our times. Um, we think this is really important to our collective future. And if any of your listeners are interested in learning more, encourage them to reach out to me. And all the links will be in the website and the show notes. Andy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Elaine. It's been a pleasure.